Welcome to Circle of Friends. Amy Whitney here with someone very special to me as she has been influential in a number of personal decisions I have made in my life. She has the most generous heart and sharpest mind. Leah Heckman is a naturopath, author, speaker and lecturer. She is located in Sydney, New South Wales. Leah is also a reproductive endocrinology and fertility specialist. Today Leah joins us from her practice in Hornsby, New South Wales. Leah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Amy. appreciate it. Wonderful. Now, let's start the show with an explanation. What exactly is an endocrinology, reproductive and fertility specialist? Um, basically, I've done my master's in this area and I've done the qualification that gynecologists, doctors, um, IVF specialists would do as well. And it enabled me to get a really good grasp of all aspects of fertility. So I was really excited to do it and I absolutely loved it. So it, it gives me additional training and, and understanding of what's going on. That's awesome. That's awesome. In your professional opinion, are fertility issues on the rise? Unfortunately, they are. Um, if you look at statistics around the world, the stats are somewhere along the lines of in Australia, it's about a one in six chance of being infertile. The UK, one in five, and the US, one in four couples will be classed as infertile. And there's so many different reasons for it. Um, you know, the biggest one, I think, is going to be age. Um, basically, we've got about three generations of women trying to conceive at the same time. You know, the normal age for conception would have been in the 30s, late 20s. We've got the uh, even the late teens, early 20s now because people are starting to be more aware of it. And we've also got women in their late 30s, early 40s trying to conceive. So we've got an enormous amount of people trying to conceive, which affects those statistics. So for people who don't have a, a scientific background, what, what do you mean by age? So age, unfortunately, is the one factor we can't control. So age is where literally if you have a woman who's 40, 41 years of age, the quality of her eggs is going to deteriorate. Um, so all women are born with all of their eggs. It's interesting when you look at the science of it, your mum will have all of the information for your eggs in her and even your grandmother because if you look at how the DNA has actually been carried through. So there's some fascinating studies that look at um, what's called epigenetics, the genetic effect of two generations and how that impacts the person's eggs or sperm or their general health even. But uh, the female, because she's born with all of her eggs, um, they go through the aging process as her body uh, ages and matures, whereas a male, he'll generate new sperm consistently. After the age of about 55, they start to go into decline in quality, but the female will just keep generating, uh, sorry, keep using the same eggs that she was born with. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I love it. And so in your opinion, like age is a major factor, but what about, um, I hear a lot about at the moment, the environment, the plastics, the pollution, does that play a role? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, there's lots of data coming out now about BPAs and talates. Mm -hmm. So BPAs are what you find in hard plastics, you know, things like water bottles. We're all very conscious of drinking purified or spring water, but we're drinking it out of these plastic bottles. And all the data, what it's finding now is that the BPA actually has a hormone deranging effect, particularly on estrogen. So in women, what it will do is it will aggravate all of her estrogen cascades. So it has the potential to influence her ovulation potential and the quality of her egg because that's what estrogen does in the female primarily. And then in the male, it has a testosterone lowering effect. So men's libido goes crashing and um, their testosterone production decreases as well. When you look at the talates, they're in soft plastics, so cling wrap and um, all sorts of soft plastics that are malleable. And what they tend to do is they have a hormone deranging effect as well, but they actually affect all hormones across the board. So not just the estrogen pathway. So it's actually even scarier. That is amazing. So when someone comes into your clinic, you do a barrage of tests or each client is, um, is there's specific indications or do you have a sort of tr set treatment plan if someone's having fertility issues? I think that there's a set uh, protocol so to speak but I always want to make it individualized so I'm someone that thinks that testing is beneficial if it gives me information but not if it causes invasion to a person or unnecessary trauma so if I, as long as I see it indicated then I'll organize a specific test I'm always interested in general health for every person so general nutritional parameters etc but for example I'm not going to go and do a miscarriage panel on someone unless they haven't had a miscarriage or I'm not necessarily going to do an environmental pollutant panel unless I'm really concerned about their potential pollutant scale so what are some of the best steps that a person can take to ensure they have optimal fertility 
the first and easiest one, but it's also the hardest one, is, is make sure that you start conceiving earlier. So I remember in my master's, um, Professor Jansen uh, was the ex-head of Sydney IVF, a major IVF centre in Australia, and he looked around at all the women in the class and said, if any of you are close to 35, have babies now. Oh. And that, that's probably the most important thing that anyone could do. So if you're 30 or under and a female and you want to have children, if there's any way that you can, I think it's a good idea to have them. Saying that, though, I think it's important to have kids when you want them or when you're ready for them. So I don't think pushing anyone into it is a good idea. But there's simple things that everybody can do to improve their fertility. You know, clean up your diet, get rid of caffeine, get rid of sugar, get rid of trans fats, um, make sure that you uh, don't have toxic cleaning products in your home, don't have exposure to plastics, um, get rid of alcohol, and recognize that there's this beautiful window called a preconception period that you can really influence the quality of your eggs and your sperm. So... Sperm takes 72 to 76 days to mature in their final stage of spermatogenesis. So what the male does for two and a half months before he tries to conceive will influence the quality of that sperm. So, you know, let's say he ejaculates today, it's actually reflecting his health two and a half months ago. For the female, the while the eggs are, you know, we're born with them, they go through a maturation process that lasts approximately 100 days that we can actually influence. Saying that, though, there is some data that says it's up to about six months. So what I say to women is for about three and a half months, consider yourself in the preconception window and really just kickstart your health. So, you know, for, for couples, you know, regardless of if they're, you know, a male and a female or two females or two males, really just work on your health together and use it as a way to start parenting your child before they even come. It's a really lovely way to just be a conscious parent. That's beautiful. I'm hearing a lot about um, conscious parenting at the moment. Um, for the audience, for anyone out there who hasn't heard that term, will you give a little description of, of what that term means to you? Conscious parenting is a way that parents can actually be conscious about the conception of their children. So it enables them to start being parents even before they actually do conceive their child. So some people that are really sensitive and in tune will actually even have an awareness or a consciousness of the child's soul even before they conceive. And they can start to have a relationship with them and, and start to get their body ready for it. So, you know, I'll work with lots of couples and people that are very aware and very sensitive will, you know, the women will come in and they'll go, oh, I'm dreaming about my baby and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, they know the sex and they've already sort of worked out the name and it's really beautiful experience that way and you know they'll, they'll be they'll start to kick start their body and they'll just be in that mindset of I don't want my child to have to go through all this stuff so I'm just going to get rid of it you know so whether it's you know going through some couples counseling to make sure that your relationship is as sensitive and caring as it can be maybe looking at your nutritional status to make sure that you're as optimally healthy as you can be eating well exercising sleeping well really taking care of yourself and having that outlook of I can actually influence the quality and the health of my child you know there's data that looks at you know one example is the iodine status of the woman and if she actually addresses her iodine status she has a direct influence on the IQ of her child the iodine status of a mother is actually really interesting. They had a paper that came out that said that the mother's iodine status before she conceives her child has a direct relationship with the subsequent IQ of her child. So it, there was this paper and it looked at it and then if mums were really deficient and the more deficient they were, the, the worse the percentage, but it had an influence where it um, reduced the child's IQ by between 10 and 40%. Um, we're talking about enormous percentages here. There was another paper that looked at how much carbohydrate the mum had in her preconception period and if she was a carbohydrate junkie, you know, lots of bread, lots of sugar, all that sort of stuff, it had a direct influence on the child's obesity rates and it influenced the child's obesity rates up until the age of seven. So we're talking about what's known as epigenetics, and it's a phenomenal influence here. You can contribute to, you know, the child's incidence of schizophrenia and, dep and depression based on the mother's maternal health. It's phenomenal. That is so fascinating, and that's something that, that everyone should know about because I, I, I think every well, majority of parents, they, they want to do what's best, but through ignorance, I, I don't mean to use that word in a derogatory way, but like through ignorance, you know, you can do damage, and um, that's why I think this interview is so vital to get out there because I don't know that um, mass consciousness is aware of, well, I certainly wasn't even aware of some of those statistics, so I just, I, I mean, I love it. It's the biggest gift of love that you could give your child is, is a great start. Leigh, I'm hearing more and more about stress being one of the major causative factors with all illness. Um, you have a really busy clinical practice. Do you see stress on the increase in, in, in your clients? 
Definitely, definitely. I mean, um, I practice in Sydney, Australia, which is classed as one of the highest stressful cities in the world, unfortunately. And I'm in an area which is a little bit more remote, so it's in a bushland sort of area, but it's still, you know, the stress is enormous. And I think that the pressures that we all have in today's society really have a big influence on our health. And when you look at how stress impacts the body, it has a direct relationship with one of our hormones called cortisol. And cortisol, when we go through stressful periods, we have an imbalance with how it gets regulated throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So people then have dramatic effects to all of their reproductive hormones in particular. So, you know, one of the, the quickest things that you'll see in a person is they'll have cortisol derangement because of stress and then they'll have subsequent effects on their libido. And I always try and remind people that libido is one of those things that, you know, is multifactorial and, you know, there's a huge emotional component. But on a physiological level, it's a it's basically a reflection of your optimal health and if you're under a lot of stress the first thing that goes is your libido and everyone knows that and so you know that your vital force and your general well-being is affected by it and it's deficient you know and when cortisol has and it wreaks its havoc estrogen levels plummet testosterone levels plummet people go to premature menopause premature andropause it's it's a really dramatic effect that's um that's a, it's, it's a cascade isn't it once one hormone's Absolutely. affected then it's um it's 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 it, it must be amazing to unravel the the root cause um in clinical practice Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've got someone sitting there and they're like, I crave chocolate and I can't sleep and I've got anxiety. And then you get underneath it all and their thyroid's out of whack and their ovaries are out of whack if they're female or their testes if they're a male. And, you know, and it just has such an enormous ripple effect. And it would be great if we could all live on a mountaintop and meditate all day and be <laughs> vegans. And I'd love to do that. But I think it's just about finding the balance in today's society and, and what you can do and what you can change. You know, maybe just reduce your commitments a little bit. You know, make sure you get eight hours of sleep a night. It has an enormous amount of difference. Absolutely. Now, every day you must witness the most amazing transformations. Do you have a, a story or a message that you can send out to anybody that has fertility issues that might inspire a bit of hope? Absolutely. Look, I, I see couples all the time in my practice and I think the one commonality and the one common thread that is the most inspiring thing for me is that the fertility journey, especially when it's a complicated one, is really one of faith. It's really one of finding your strength in yourself and, and being able to just keep keep motivating yourself to go forward. It's incredibly vulnerable. You know, it's more it's one of the most vulnerable health issues I think. I mean they all have their vulnerabilities, but you know, fertility is meant to be something that's just a natural evolution. We're all meant to just have babies and, you know, you think about it, you have a partner, you make a baby, easy. And when it doesn't work the way you want it to, it takes a lot of courage. So I'm routinely reminded about the courage from my patients, the courage that they continue to walk along this path and they continue to go, no, I want a child, I feel that it's something that's important to me. And they continue to try to find that strength inside themselves to actually make it happen. And, you know, I'll see miraculous cases all the time and I'm always reminded that that miracle has really been created by that person and their faith and their belief in that it can happen. And, you know, the amount that they let go and the amount that they change to make it happen is it's really, really inspiring. That would be so rewarding, absolutely. Now, yeah. I understand that you also can treat international clients, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I do. I treat a lot of people around the world. Uh, I think Skype is probably the best invention um, <laughs> and we can have a, a lovely chat and see each other and it works really well. Fantastic. And do you have um, a, a website that you prefer people to contact you on or what's the best way to reach you? My website's there and I've got lots and lots of articles that I'm constantly updating. So people, you know, I get comments from people all around the world just saying, you know, oh, finally you've made a really succinct, you know, assessment of something. You know, I did a soy article this week and it was really interesting, the feedback. But there's an inquiry section on there um, and you can have a look and look about all the information and all the, the resources that are there for people as well. It's an amazing site, absolutely. Thank you for, um, for, for posting it, like so much free information and um, I love it. Now I've got two more questions for you today. I know you're in a busy practice, but I'm gonna just throw these in because they're my favorite Please. questions. So what yes. has been your biggest inspiration? Uh, my biggest inspiration, definitely multifactorial. I don't think I could identify it, you know, in, in one person or one event. I actually think I'm inspired on a daily basis. I'm really blessed in that regard. 
um, I love what I do. I love getting up out of bed and I love seeing people and sharing their journey and each person that I get to interact with, I'm absolutely inspired. You know, when I um, have the privilege of lecturing either at the university or, you know, at seminars and things like that, I'm inspired by the audience and their questions and watching how they actually process information. Um, I'm inspired by my family, my husband, my uh, friends, my pets. Uh, you know, I, I'm inspired regularly and I think that that's my, my nature. Uh, I'm just someone that likes growing and learning. So I try to, to get inspiration from everything. Beautiful. And, and I know you do, absolutely. And your final words of wisdom today. Um. The most important thing is for people, if they do have a fertility concern or even any other health concern, is to really connect themselves with the power of the human body. I see miracles happen every day. You know, I see people that are told that they're completely infertile, will never have a child, and they do. I see people that, um, you know, have horrible conditions and they're able to get through it. The power of the body is phenomenal. Um, You know, whether or not we put it down to the heart or the mind or the spirit, I do think that the person's sense of faith and strength is what gets them through it. But never give up unless something, you know, if something is really important to you. Never never close that door if it's something that you want because there should always be a solution. I don't believe that the human body is designed to have a disease. I don't believe that it's designed to have a problem. It just means that you need to find more answers and the body can do a lot. So, yeah, I, I like to respect it that way. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for your time today, Leah. It's been such a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate it. Many blessings. Thank you.